panelists for being here. We are really excited. We have, as Jennifer and Pam said, we've been talking about trees for a while now. So we're really, really glad you were able to make it. Um, and I basically just want us to kind of lead an introduction. Uh, we like to know where people are uh, connecting in from. And uh, tonight, if you could also just let us know you know, what's what's your favorite tree and why? Um, and if you don't have a favorite tree, just what do you appreciate most about trees? Um, and then when you're done introducing yourself, you can choose someone else to, to go next. And I'll, I'll go first. Um, I'm connecting in from Chicago in Logan Square, and uh, my favorite tree is a willow tree. I grew up on a farm, and we have a really beautiful willow tree there with a little creek running by it and frogs and it's just have I have really good memories of that and I actually named my son Will and I think it's connected to that and I yeah sometimes even call him Willow so anyway uh let's see um I can't see names of people Eva do you want to go next okay so hi um my name's Eva um I'm coming from Naperville and uh, this is my first meeting, so I'm glad it worked out. Um, and it's kind of hard to pick a favorite tree, but uh, I really, I guess the thing I love about trees the most is the shade, especially on days like this. Mm -hmm. um, I head right down to the forest preserve to walk my dogs because it's so much cooler. <laughs> yeah, so. great. Yeah, yep. thank you. And could you choose someone to go next, please? Okay, how about Mary? Okay, I'm Mary McLaughlin, and my favorite tree, hands down, is the breadfruit tree. It's a tropical tree. It doesn't grow here, but it really is a tree that I believe can feed the planet. And I'm from Winnetka, Illinois, of course, Illinois, and uh, but I was born in Jamaica, and I grew up eating the fruit from this tree. My next person is bread. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fred Clark. I'm your uh, neighbor to the north from Madison, Wisconsin. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, just on the other side of the pond. Uh, my favorite tree is the white pine, which is the you know, iconic tree of the North Woods and uh, still one of our most wonderful native species. Can you pick someone, please, Fred? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ray, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Hi, I'm Ray Ostrowski. I live in Glenview, Illinois, and uh, it is hard to pick a favorite tree. I got a couple came to mind, but I'm going to say uh, um, American chestnut. Uh, we had a great big one uh, up the street for me where I grew up uh, in northeast Pennsylvania, Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. I remember going up in, uh, in the fall, find, getting those uh, nice brown chestnuts. Um, and unfortunately, you just don't see them now anymore, of course. So. Uh, and I will pick uh, Dave Rice. Let me just get off mute there for a second. Hi, Dave Rice, St. Charles, Illinois. And uh, I'm going to be exotic. So I, I lived in Australia for a few years, and I'd say the eucalyptus tree. Uh, one of the interesting things that happens is, uh, you know, they have the blue, oh, we call them the blue mountains, and it was the eucalyptus oil coming off the trees, which made the air blue. So it's... Unfortunately, the downside of eucalyptus trees is that you have these awful fires sometimes. You have what? Uh, awful fires. Because oh, fires. The oil, the oil is very flammable. Uh, how about Sarah Sanford? Sarah? Mute, Sarah. You're on mute. Thank you, um, Dave. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm uh, living in New uh, Northbrook. And um, I am part of Go Green Northbrook. So my, um, my favorite tree of the week is the tr uh, truffula tree, tr truffula tree, truffula tree, because it sounds so much like truffula tree. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we just planted three of them at St. Giles Church um, this week. Thank you. Could you oh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, Jane Goldberg. Hi, everybody. I'm Jane. I am calling in from Chicago. 
And uh, we lived in Northfield until earlier this year. And I had, if we were staying there another year, I, I was planning on planting some oak trees. So I'm going to say oak, since they are beautiful, stately, classic trees from Illinois. Um, and um, I think that's it. Anything else I was supposed to add? That's it. Just pick that's some. Okay. Um, let's see. How about um, Edith Macra? There. Um, I'm Edith Macra. I'm calling in from Bloomingdale, uh, Western uh, Suburbs, and I uh, never get pressed in or cornered into picking one tree uh, that I love because I'm very close to uh, many of them, but I will talk about one tree that's a particular favorite these days because I'm moving, uh, moving to Forest Avenue, um, and I am taking with me my bur oak, which is uh, really one of my favorite trees, that was a favor in our wedding 10 years ago which in our wedding anniversary is 10 years on Saturday and that tree is coming with us um, to the new home. It's a, it's pretty good size now. So that's my favorite uh, tree of the week is my fir oak. And I'm going to pick Amon to go next. Uh, hi. Hello, everyone. I'm joining in from Hyde Park in Chicago. I'm a grad student at University of Chicago. And so basically I'm from India. So, and one of my favorite tree is uh, coconut, uh, coconut. So I come from the coastal part of the country, uh, country and uh, uh, where I used to eat a lot of coconut, uh, uh, drink a lot of coconut water, including its uh, cream. So I am, uh, in fact, missing a lot uh, in current times because in summers uh, we used to have a lot of coconut water, and uh, yeah, that is one of my favorite tree. Uh, I'll. Choose Nitesh. Hi, uh, Nitesh Bajaj. This is uh, the first call I've been able to join as well. I'm calling in from South Loop in Chicago. Um, never thought too hard about my favorite tree, but I would probably say, especially growing up, I really loved ginkgo trees just because of the cool leaves and fun as, as a kid. But I have to think about that some more. <laughs> Um, okay, who has it gone? Pamela, I think. Uh, I'm Pam Tate. I live in Oak Park, uh, and uh, I have two. I can't narrow to one. Uh, I love ash trees. I have a purple ash in my yard. I just love them, the colors they turn. And I really love banyan trees. Mm, yeah, they're cool. They're just amazing. And I mean, they're just fascinating to look at. I love really mature banyan trees. I don't think that Link has talked. Nope. My name's Link Cohen. Um, I live in Chicago, but um, I lived for uh, many years in uh, Gary, Indiana, and my home bordered on a section of the National Park that was a black oak savanna. And uh, um, so I would say that uh, black oaks, uh, because of the wonderful um, ecology that uh, uh, is supported by the black oak savanna, that that would be my favorite tree. And I'll um, call on uh, Eva. Eva. Eva went. Oh, Cynthia. Oh, she went already. Okay. Um, but uh, Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia. Cynthia. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cynthia. I live in the Streeterville neighborhood of Chicago. And I had never thought about a favorite tree, but where I grew up outside New York City, we had a dogwood tree in our front yard. And even as a pretty young person, I loved it because I could climb it because one of the branches was very low. And I, I really love all the fruit trees that blossom in, in the spring. The, the, it's gone too quickly, but I think they're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the only other person is Jennifer. No, Mark. Jennifer and Mark. Jennifer, Mark is with us. And uh, can I have my husband talk with, when you're done? because he's listening and I know he has a favorite tree. Okay, okay sure. I think Mark is off mute now. What about Bob? Yeah. yeah. Well, oh. Are you available? Mark Whitman? Are yep. you? I'm here. 
Go for oh, it. There. Uh, I can't say I have a favorite tree. Um, I had to think about it while everyone else was going, but I would say live oak. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any special reason, Mark? Just uh, I've spent a lot of time in New Orleans, uh, and I've gone to some of the plantations there, and uh, uh, there's uh, one I can't remember. It's a, it's a they, they, they've lined the, uh, the alley in front of the plantation with live oak, and they're the, the trees are 400 years old. Well, as soon as you say live oak, you mark yourself as a southerner. <laughs> well, New Orleans, to be proper. Yeah. Yes. Oh. That's south. <laughs> no, I actually, actually, no, but uh, that's, for, that's another discussion. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Where are you calling in from, Mark? I apologize. Sorry, I didn't say Andersonville. Ah, okay. Thanks. Okay, so we have Cynthia and Bob and... Um, Mary, your husband, I forgot his name. Mike. Mike. So okay. we uh, were uh, I'm Mary's partner in marriage and in business. So we run our charity together. And we've been in this house 20 years. And I bought the elm tree, a huge American elm. It's 80 feet tall. When I bought the tree, they threw in the house for free. <laughs> so that's my favorite tree, <laughs> along with the breadfruit. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Last but not least, Cynthia and Bob. You guys, are you Jennifer two? and Bob. Jennifer and Bob. Oh, Jennifer and Bob. Sorry. Me Lintons. <laughs> There's a Jeff Linton in our chapter too. Anyway, um, we are in Northbrook. Bob is actually a recent uh, chapter, new chapter member. Um, but and we're gonna. Well, we might use our double, but we both really like our tricolor beach. I had one at my house in the city. I mean, birch. We, beach or birch? I think it's beach. Is it beach or birch? Do you guys we know? Don't know but we it's love like it. has the red, it's, it's okay. a tricolor leaves. A lot oh, of it could be beach. either. Okay, thank you. Both. It's probably a beach. Those are more popular in the city. Yeah, so. I think so. Well, we have in the city, and then when we did the landscaping at our yeah. house, we have one that's brilliant right now. Um, and we're hoping maybe we'll find out later that we can have one in a pot on our roof in the city when we're not going to have a yard going forward. But I can ask that question later. But do you want to? Yeah. So, tree? yeah. So um, I thought of the uh, Aspen tree that I see when I uh, go to skiing in Colorado, visiting my children, Cynthia's grandchildren. Um, they're beautiful in the white, the white. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's a good memory and a good association being in, the, in, the, in Colorado in the mountains. All right, guys, thanks so much. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Pam um, to get our panel started. Yeah, we, we are really lucky. Um, I just can't believe how grateful I am for having these three panelists. In, in my short knowing of them, I've already learned some things. Um, Fred is going to go first. And let me just say a little bit about Fred. I'll, I'll say something about the person just before they talk. Uh, Fred his official role is he's executive director of Wisconsin's Green Fire. And this is an organization dedicated to science in conservation. Um, he's also the senior forester for the Forest Stewards Guild. And what they do is they're a national organization and they're dedicated to sustainable forestry and forest science. Um, and he's on the board of the American Forest Foundation. Uh, I think what's important about Fred is he's had a 30 year career in forest conservation and he, he has worked in many uh, positions, but one that stood out for me was forest ecologist for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so this gives you an idea of Fred's background. So Fred, why don't you lead off here? We're really happy to have you. Well, thanks Pam and uh, thanks everyone. I'm glad to be with you and I'm going to share my screen and I hope that uh, you can tell me that I've done that successfully. Uh, by the way, can you see my screen saver? Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. That's a uh, 40 inch white pine tree that's growing in the Huron Mountains in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So I, uh, I get to look at that every day when I log on. Um, but really glad to be with you all and you're talking about topics that are certainly close to our, my heart, and I think uh, Edith and Mary's as well. Um, do I have full screen there? 
yes. for the yes. slide I do. So um, what I would will try to do to open up briefly is just cover some of the science and the, um, the, the picture around what we often call natural climate solutions. And different organizations use different language around this, but it's the whole idea that the, the, uh, the farms and the forests and the trees and the parks and the conservation lands around us all are part of the uh, picture of our changing climate and greenhouse gases, and, and they're an important part of a solution uh, to a cleaner, greener planet, which is something I think we're all aiming for. And uh, to just dive into why that happens and how it happens, I'm going to take us all back for a moment to uh, Plant Biology 101. And maybe you had this in high school or in college, but um, and, and none of this is new to any of us. But I think it's helpful to remember that every, every plant uh, with, with uh, chlorophyll in it is basically doing the job of capturing sunlight as energy and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, along with water and, and minerals from the soil. And they do this remarkable little thing of, of converting those elements into uh, basically simple sugars, uh, carbohydrates, that, are, um, that do a couple of things. They're uh, used to drive the energy processes of the tree, so the sugars are burned, and that creates energy for growth. Uh, but they're also uh, moved into different parts of the tree and stored. And so trees that are actively growing, like right now, are moving sugars into the roots of the tree, as well as into the branches during this intense period of seasonal growth. And, and carbon is being stored um, during that process. There's a reverse of that process that also goes on, and, and that's what, what the physiologists call respiration. So when those sugars are burned, uh, to drive energy, energetic processes in a tree or a plant or a corn crop um, that releases CO2. So, so we have some offsetting um, activities there. And then uh, when a tree dies or is cut down or when a plant uh, dies or is harvested, um, that plant material as it decays is also giving off CO2. So again, offsetting processes that that balance each other out, but ultimately end up storing carbon uh, in, in a relatively stable form. Um, overall, we know that our, our forests in the United States store a tremendous amount of carbon. Um, likewise, the agricultural lands and the prairies um, and, and savannas that, that we have around us do that as well. Here's a, a, a look at a big picture schematic from the US EPA about carbon fluxes in the atmosphere. And if you understand all of this, you're doing much better than I am. Um, but I want to just point out a couple of things. If you look over on the far right, you'll see the, the, the input to the atmosphere from fossil fuels and cement. And that's estimated at six gigatons a year. Now, I can't visualize what a gigaton is, but we know that that's a lot of CO2 or CO2 equivalent in the form of greenhouse gases. It would also include things like methane and, and uh, uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, there's a lot of offsetting activities that, um, that result in a net balance of greenhouse gases. But over here on the left, I want you to look at the, the activities of respiration and photosynthesis that we just talked about. The net balance of respiration and photosynthesis in, in forest and terrestrial plants around the world is, is estimated to be about 1.3 gigatons per year. What that's basically saying is that all of the plants in our world are offsetting about a quarter of the fossil fuel and greenhouse gases being emitted by human activity. So that's a huge lever in, in helping offset the impacts of climate change being driven by human activities. Uh, the Nature Conservancy that you're all familiar with um, is doing a lot of work on the idea of natural climate solutions. And uh, this table, uh, there will be no tests on this uh, presentation, but this table basically shows their estimation of, of the climate mitigation potential impact for a whole variety of 21 different uh, strategies. And 
if you look at the size of the green bars, that's the relative size of impact related to that strategy. And if you can see this, the number one strategy on top is reforestation. Uh, so using their analysis, putting trees in the ground is the number one thing that we can do uh, to help offset climate change um, and, and uh, pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. But the other strategies here are also very important. And we're gonna talk about those um, in another minute or two, but they involve things like protecting the forests that we have, really critical to avoiding further losses of CO2. Uh, they include things like uh, modified agricultural practices, like protecting wetlands, like protecting prairies, uh, like converting annual crops into perennial crops. Um, so we've got a suite of really powerful tools that can be used everywhere from our wild areas to our cities. And that's what we want to talk about more today. Uh, in the realm of agriculture, uh, agriculture as a land use has tremendous potential to store carbon. Unfortunately, the way it's practiced today, it uh, generally does not have as big of a benefit as we would like to see. And, and the main reason for that, and, and there are a lot of numbers here that aren't necessarily something you need to dive into deeply, but with the annual agriculture that dominates, especially most of the Midwestern farming, uh, corn and soybeans, uh, we're generally seeing more emissions, more net loss of carbon from those practices than we are gaining. And, and the reason is that annual tillage tends to expose soil that releases carbon to decompose into the atmosphere. And because we have the added effects of um, uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers that end up contributing a lot of greenhouse gas, uh, nitrous oxide into the environment. And methane that is the result of um, uh, what's coming from the bellies of cows and from their manure. Um, so collectively, Farming um, has a big room for improvement in contributing to uh, a cleaner atmosphere. Uh, but there are opportunities to do that. And, and one of the main ones is by what we call perennializing. So whenever we can move from a fully annual based system based on regular tillage and planting and fertilizing to a system that's more perennial, whether that's uh, uh, dairy cattle and grass, or whether it's using cover crops, or in this photo, silvopasture, which involves integrating trees into, into cropping systems, we get a big gain in both protecting soil and in, in protecting carbon. Um, but just to shift gears again, uh, another really important component of our overall carbon budgets are what we can call our conservation lands. The prairies and the wetlands and the old growth forest preserves um, and some of the other natural communities that are really important parts of protecting biodiversity are also really important uh, storage reservoirs for carbon. And prairies in particular, as you probably know, have really deep, deep rooted systems where they have the opportunity, prairie roots may extend down six feet or more. It's a ton of carbon stored literally tons of carbon stored in the below ground uh, part of prairie ecosystems. And likewise with our wetlands, uh, intact wetlands, they have very deep hydric soils within which a lot of carbon is stored in the form of peat. Um, and not only are these systems like giant bank accounts for essentially stored carbon, but they're also at risk. Um, if those prairies and wetlands are developed, if they're lost, if they're plowed, if they're drained, um, we have the potential to release a lot of carbon. And those, those releases end up working against us in the atmosphere. Uh, and finally, we'll start talking about trees and forests. And overall, work done by Nature Conservancy and others estimates that forests in the United States offset about 14% of our total carbon emissions. So when you think about that, that's a huge lever for basically helping soak greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Um, we can improve on that though, 
by better management of forests and, and by making sure that we protect and, and restore forests uh, where we have them. Uh, so things to think about there in your forest preserves or in the, the forests and the parks and communities or places around you, keep them intact. Uh, keep those trees standing. One of the most powerful things to understand is that a large tree is like a bank account that you've been investing in for a hundred years or more. And the amount of carbon stored in a large tree may be in excess of eight or 10,000 pounds. Um, that's, that's a huge amount of carbon to lose if that tree is lost unnecessarily. So protect the forests that we have. We plant trees to increase forest cover. We can improve forest management uh, to store more carbon by having more biomass in those forests. Um, we can build with wood. And most importantly, uh, for this conversation, we can plant trees in our cities. Uh, I want to make a pitch here for wood. And my home state of Wisconsin is a big forest product state. But um, what's interesting to understand is that, that building with wood has a lot of benefits for the climate. Uh, especially when we're able to substitute wood for other materials like concrete or steel or aluminum that have very high carbon footprints because of the energy it takes to produce them. Um, wood actually is a very environmentally friendly building material. And, and there's a good story about that that I think Edith will talk more about. Uh, finally, here at home in, in the cities where we live, the, the trees around us are a really important part of a cleaner atmosphere and, and storing CO2 and, and sequestering CO2 out of the atmosphere. But I think you all also realize that trees have so many other benefits in our communities uh, by keeping temperatures cooler, improving air quality, which improves human health, uh, reducing noise, improving property values, and, and overall creating livable communities. There's so many good reasons to invest in canopy and green space and trees in the places we live uh, that it's absolutely worth our investment. Um, so ways that we can think about doing that are to um, look at where disparities occur, look at, at communities that are underrepresented or underserved or, or under stress uh, because of poor health outcomes or crime or, uh, or other demographic liabilities and almost invariably, those are communities that lack trees. Uh, does having more trees solve everything? No, probably not. But we know that, that trees in our communities are a huge factor in, in so many other outcomes. Um, so it's an issue of, equ of equity. It's an issue of environmental justice. And it's an issue of community engagement that, that really is a rallying cry for our citizens. Uh, so in closing, I would just say that uh, Keep in mind some of the most important strategies that, that we have. One is to protect those places that we have that are already storing that carbon. Those mature forests and wetlands and natural areas and parks are, are doing their job. And, and through our planning and zoning efforts and through our, our civic engagement, we need to make sure that those places are preserved to the extent possible uh, and for as long as it's feasible to do that. Uh, that keeps our money in the bank. Uh, secondly, the restoration work, uh, the investment in prescribed burning or invasive species control or planting, both in natural areas and in our communities, is so important to increasing uh, those carbon stores and, and really adding, adding new carbon, new CO2, new clean air to our bank accounts. Um, that's all work that we can be involved in. Uh, so with that, I think, Pam, you don't want to take questions now. so. Would you like to just wrap up here and? Yeah, um, I, I hope you can hold, if you have specific questions, we're gonna have a, a long question and answer session after our presenters talk. So if you can hold on to it till then, that would be great. Um, thank you, Fred. And uh, Mary is, is gonna go next. And Mary's gonna give us more of a global perspective, um, especially um, because of the work she does. Um, as she said when she introduced herself, she was born in Jamaica. Uh, she was educated there as a geologist. And she worked at the Jamaican Geological Survey, among other positions. 
but um, relevant to this discussion is that uh, 12 years ago in 2008, she created the Trees That Feed Foundation. Trees That Feed Foundation. Uh, the mission of her organization is to plant fruit trees that feed people and create jobs and benefit the environment. And in that 12 year period, the foundation has distributed over 200,000 fruit trees, um, has, has also given 500,000 meals to children and supported smallholder farmers in 18 countries. So Mary is, is interested not only in the planting of the trees, but the nurturing of these trees to maturity. And uh, she'll talk about the foundation's work and what's happening around the world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now and um, let me know if you can see it. So I think it's, it's good. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so trees that feed, we have um, three missions. We've actually added one more, but I'll go into that at the end. We decided that if we wanted to reforest, and we wanted to reforest because probably 30 years ago, I heard Al Gore speak. And I heard him speak. He had just come back from the Antarctica, and he had looked at some um, cores of the ice, and he had looked at the amount of carbon on those cores, and he noticed such a difference in the amount of carbon as the Industrial Revolution started. So he got me thinking about this. I was a child of environmentalists. I grew up with um, my father reading me before I could read. He was reading me Silent Spring. My daughter is named Rachel after Rachel Carson, so I come to this naturally. And I realized that um, if we could plant food trees and we could create a reason for those trees to live, because in the tropics, it's really hard for poor farmers or, or poor people to keep to keep those trees alive. You don't want to plant trees and then they become cut down for firewood. So we realized we needed an entire to support the market chain of these trees. That would keep farmers engaged in the trees because this is how they would make a living. So we're planting money trees. So we um, our mission is to plant trees to feed people and to help the environment and to create jobs. So my second slide, I'm not sure why I can't, why it won't share. Okay, there it is. Um, planting the trees. We plant trees in about 18 countries in the world because my husband and I are from Jamaica. We realized that um, we wanted to work in the tropics. You have sunshine 12 months of the year. So you're sequestering carbon um, all year. There's no winter. And the main tree we plant is the breadfruit tree. If you look those little boys on the left, that's a little breadfruit tree that they're planting. This is a large breadfruit tree on the right. That's a farmer with his tree. Big, huge leaves, lots of photosynthesis going on there. These trees live for well over a hundred years. And we get, we work a lot in Haiti and um, we transport these trees is any way we can. And here's um, some trees being transported on the sides of donkeys. We work in Jamaica a lot. Jamaica is really our success story. We have good partnerships there with the Ministry of Agriculture. We give them the trees through their extension agencies. They work with, um, with farmers and they get trees to farmers. So we, we distribute thousands of trees every year in Jamaica. Haiti is a challenge, but we're working in Haiti and we're planting a lot of trees there. So we feed people and we take the breadfruit. The breadfruit fruit, it's about the size of a melon, but it's filled with a dense carbohydrate, nutrient rich, lots of vitamins and minerals, but it's, it tastes like a bagel. And we, we've developed a method of turning that fresh breadfruit with a shelf life of about the life of a banana to preserving it with a solar dehydrator. And I'll show you a picture of the dehydrator at the end. And by doing that, we grind that dried breadfruit into flour. So we have this breadfruit flour, which is a gluten-free flour, 
And then in Haiti, we do about a quarter million meals a year, mainly in Haiti, and we feed the underserved. So we feed the littlest children and we feed the elderly. And the flour is used, you'll see those, the older couple with sacks of breadfruit flour, they use that as like oatmeal, think of it as more like oatmeal to make a, a warm cereal in the morning. That's how they, the elderly eat it. And children do the same, but we also contract with bakers in Haiti where they make those biscuits. Those children are holding those biscuits. It's a cross between a biscotti and a, it's more like a biscotti and it's made with breadfruit flour. So we're planting the trees. The people who have the trees now have market for it. The people who process it into flour, they have jobs and the bakers have jobs. So we then buy these breadfruit biscottis from the bakers and that creates a value chain. So everybody's making money along the way and the value is the tree. So the tree is valued, less likelihood of the tree being cut down. So creating jobs, jobs is important. So you can see on the left, that lady, she makes breadfruit biscotti. Breadfruit are called comparettes. It's a French word. It's made with breadfruit flour, ginger, coconut, and molasses, all sourced locally, all giving jobs to these people who have very little employment. So it's creating an economy and all because of the trees that we're planting. So we run cooking schools in, in these countries because breadfruit flour is new. They're used to imported wheat. That's, um, they, they're, they, it's, it's just easy for them to do it because they've been using wheat for years. But then we work with um, entrepreneurs. We love working with entrepreneurs. And this couple, that's me there in the checkered shirt, that's my, my husband beside me. And that's a couple who, um, they have a community co-op and we've helped them establish a factory. They're US certified so they can export to the United States and they make breadfruit products. They make pancake mixes. That's a basket of chips that they make. And they are, they are exporting a lot of their breadfruit products. And um, it helps the economy. These are, these are agroforest systems and it, it's lifting people out of poverty through trees. Um, this is a piece from one of our annual reports that I just wanted to show you because we, we not just plant trees. You know, many people go in and plant trees. And in, in Haiti, we see a lot of people planting trees, which is admirable. But we know that for it to work, you have to support the entire value chain. So we, we work with nurseries to grow trees. We, um, we show techniques on supporting agroforestry. We help with harvesting and pruning techniques, making breadfruit flour, and um, we help them to market the product as well. Uh, we just don't plant breadfruit. Breadfruit's our main one because it's one of the few trees on the planet that gives you your basic carbohydrate. It can replace a lot of the wheat that's farmed annually. So this is a perennial food supply. I've just learned that from Fred. I'm going to be using it. It's this one tree you plant once and you reap, you harvest twice a year, every year, and you can create tremendous value from it. So we work on the entire value chain. And that's important because small farmers that do agroforestry have a hard time marketing their products. And I think we spend as much time um, helping them with marketing their products and developing packaging for them and giving them techniques and posters so they can sell in the marketplace because we know that this is important. We also educate. Education is key. If children grow up loving trees, I grew up loving trees because of my parents, then you become stewards of trees. So we've created this book. It's actually a coloring book and we have it in probably eight languages now. It's in English, it's in Creole, French Creole, we have it in French, Spanish, um, we have it in Swahili, um, in languages for Cambodia and Indonesia and um, Zanzibar, is it Zanzibar, I think so, Tanzania, and um, the, it's, uh, of course in Swahili, and we, we print locally, so we're not shipping. 
these books are all on PDF files. We switch, we, we can fix the languages. We get local printers to print it. And then we just give them away to students. And it can be integrated in their lessons so they grow up loving trees. And it also gives them tips on, on how their parents can make a living with trees. So this is some critical. In Jamaica, we work closely with the Peace Corps and a lot of environmental and educational Peace Corps volunteers. They love our books. We just deliver them to the Peace Corps office in Kingston and the volunteers just pick them up and take them out to the rural communities. And this, this is just absolutely key. So that's a solar dehydrator that I was telling you about. My husband, Mike, who is here, he designed it along with Northwestern University students. It's actually quite big, it's 20 feet across. And you are seeing the back of it. So it's like a cabinet, it has a solar fan that extracts the moisture. And on the back side, they have shelves. You put your shredded breadfruit or dried mangoes or dried pap or papayas that you want to dry. And these wings that you see on the side, they act like a, imagine if you're in the car in the summer and the windows are locked and it gets hot. That's a method there. The warm air goes into the cabinet, comes up through that chimney and the solar fan and extracts the moisture of, from apples or bananas or, um, or breadfruit or um, guavas, all of these tropical fruit with short shelf lives can now be preserved just by dehydrating them. And then you can either have a mango snack of dried mangoes, or you can have dried breadfruit that you can grind into flour. So really, that's, um, that's what we do. These are the countries we work in. We can only work in a country where you have, um, um, we have good partners. So we look for good partners. Um, many of our partners are already, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna stop it so you can see my face. So many of our partners are already actively planting trees. They tend to plant timber trees. And what we do is we integrate our trees with their planting programs so they can have an integrated agroforest system. So that's what we do. And I'll wait for questions at the end. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we're, we're moving back into Chicago. <laughs> and um, our third presenter is Edith Macra. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of her, but when she was Mayor Daly's assistant, she earned the title of Tree Zarina for Chicago um, because she created policies and programs to plant and protect trees in Chicago. Um, I should mention that she started her career as a field arborist. Um, but I think what's important is she created three programs that have cultivated trees as well as advocates for trees here. Um, some of them you may know, Neighborhoods, Neighbor Woods program for open lands. She created that. The Green Streets um, program for she did for Mayor Daly and the community trees program for the Martin, Morton Arboretum. So she's been involved in all those things uh, and today she's director of environmental initiatives for the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. So she's still a, a she's still a Zarina of some kind but she's she's uh, was Mayor Daly's tree Zarina which I like. <laughs> so uh, we're very lucky to have Edith with us. Thank you. It is fun to be here. Thank you so much. I was very impressed with everybody's um, favorite tree and your sophisticated knowledge of um, the diversity of trees that you love. Um, and I was very inspired by Mary, but Fred, we haven't met before. And I think you're right. I think we're going to uh, mesh and dovetail very nicely. So congratulations on putting together um, such an effective panel. I wanted to uh, pivot from Fred's talk about forests and Mary's talk about um, cultivating trees for food and talk about the urban forest. Um, so just to lay the, <clears throat> the groundwork on that, there's 
um, the urban forest, and Fred pointed out how important it is. But when we talk about the urban forest, we're not just talking about trees that look like they belong in a forest, like a forest preserve or a park. We're talking about the trees that are all around us, um, that surround homes, and it's all part of the urban landscape, whether they're cultivated and they connect up to um, traditional forest lands. So when we think about managing the urban forests, we're doing it differently because the landscape, when Fred's taking care of forest land, native forest land, um, there is a soil and an ecosystem that is very different than what we have when you buy a home or if Jennifer and uh, Bob want to put a tree on the roof, that's still part of the urban forest, but we don't have the same kinds of benefits um, that allow trees to thrive and that kind of interaction. What we have is the interaction with people um, and structures. And so when you think about urban forests, think about them as very functional and integrated with people and trees. The mo when, when I studied traditional forestry in school, um, the, you're, you're always managing a forest for an end product. And uh, traditionally that was for timber products or paper products, um, or it might be for what watershed. You're managing a tree for, for uh, recreational land when you go skiing in Colorado. Um, and in the urban forest, you're managing the forest for the end product is the benefits to people. So we call those ecosystem services, but just a little uh, uh, place setting there in terms of um, the, uh, managing and thinking about trees in the urban forest. Uh, and I'm going to zero on, I will admit, I found an old talk that I had given on trees and climate change, but I want to um, pivot you a little bit to thinking about the role of trees in, um, in climate change. And there's a number of benefits to them. I certainly you think about uh, their role in mitigating CO2 emissions, but they have a different function, slightly different function in the urban forest because of where they are amongst people and structures. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, just helping trees to endure um, the climate change and why we want to do that, just the same with what Fred said about preserving forests. And because Pamela told me you're all chomping at the bit to get something done, I'll conclude briefly uh, with what you can do um, to preserve the urban forest. So I'll talk about one of the most impactful things uh, that urban forests do, and that is to mitigate the heat island effect. This is um, a climate adaptation issue. So our built structures in the, um, the y-axis or the height of the bar there is temperatures. Um, and the temperatures can be radically different as you move in from rural forest land or rural landscapes into the city center because of the collective action of um, structures and human activity in storing and, and retaining heat and again, without getting um, too much into detail, you want to control that heat island effect for human health and um, comfort, as well as for energy conservation and uh, air quality. So we'll talk about the role in that. And so someone who was it that said early on that best thing about trees is the shade. Uh, so there's direct shading, but there's also collective shading, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so you get to enjoy shade when you sit under it, but there's impacts on the urban heat island um, and quality of life and air quality when you have a collective thriving urban, uh, urban forest. Um, so kind of back to Fred's slide when he said we need to, to green up our cities. Um, a, a, a city or an urban landscape that has trees integrated into it successfully is cooler. So many of you come from neighborhoods that are very well treated um, and they have a collective uh, benefit because the entire neighborhood is cooler. They cool in a lot of different ways. So there's the direct shading, um, which cools the urban heat island. There is that, what Fred was also talking about, that evapotranspirative cooling, um, that when trees are processing uh, water and energy, they're doing the same impact that provides direct cooling. It's our perspiring. Um, it's the same way that they actually lower temperature. And then uh, the insulating homes, um, which you can do uh, by planting strategically. And I'll talk um, a lot about that for lowering energy um, use, which, or, which is just as important, every bit as important as using renewable energy um, and is really in the energy efficiency category. Um, there's some modest benefits uh, for winter heating um, that I will talk about briefly. But a lot of times when you hear about the benefits of um, urban trees in terms of uh, energy conservation. I will say that they're not always in northern climates. So thinking specifically uh, about ours. So the point here is a thriving urban forest cools the, the temperature and lowers our um, energy needs for an entire community or a region. 
Um, and so I love this, uh, to, to give this talk, and pardon my dizzying slide there, but the reason that I like this animated slide is to think about shading over the course of a day. Um, and that's when you really pivot on the benefits of an urban tree and a landscape, is just making mo the most of the uh, placement of the tree relative to, um, to heating. I said there, there are modest benefits and most of the really dramatic, you know, you can plant shade trees and save 30% on your energy bill, not from the Chicago area. Um, so we spend 10 times more for heating than cooling and we won't get into the, the numbers there, but the, the savings are considerably more modest than you are when you're in Southern climates uh, for planting shade trees. You can shade, but you have to think about it um, specifically and remember that most of the, the uh, energy demands is for, uh, for winter warming rather than, um, than direct shade and cooling. So a lot of times you've, you've probably heard plant a, a tree on the south side of the home for cooling. And that is totally true in the summertime. In the winter, because the sun is lower, you need as much of what they call solar gain as you can possibly get. So you don't want any shading when you're going to get the warming winter, uh, winter sun. So you want that to come in through your roof. You want it to come in through the, uh, the walls of your home. And you want to gain that benefit in terms of passive solar heating uh, in the winter. So that idea of planting um, the, for, to shade the summer while you'll get benefits and it's cooling and you should put, if you're, if you're thinking about your landscape, you should plant a tree, if you at all can, in your outdoor room where you spend time um, and you want to plant for the, the, uh, the biggest solar gains in the summertime, um, which are a little bit different. So plant on your patio definitely to cool and enjoy the shade. It's usually, so, so just to kind of illustrate what's going on here, when you have um, a summer sun, which I think you can see my hands up there, it's high in the sky, um, you want to shade your roof and uh, you want the, the sun to cast the most amount of shade on your, um, where, where it is in the summertime when there are leaves on it. In the wintertime, if you look at the shadow that's cast um, on that same tree, if you even the branches, while it's deciduous, that's actually creating a, an undesired shade in the wintertime on the south wall of that home when you could be getting solar gain. Um, and that's important because the most impact that you're getting uh, from, from uh, urban trees is really from this energy efficiency gain. Um, and so here in the summertime when the, uh, when the sun is high in the sky, you wanna, uh, your heat comes through um, the east facing windows, on the top of your roof over the, um, when it's high in the sky and then the west. The hottest sun is actually in the west. So the very best place to kind of cut to the chase uh, to plant a tree in your yard is to is to cut this the morning and particularly the afternoon sun because that's the hottest avoid the uh, south wall hope that's not too confusing usually don't do this talk in eight minutes so um, <laughs> the other thing that you can do is shade to insulate your home so foundation plantings but if you're putting shrubs um, around your home or grasses there's a couple of places you can put them um, that are just as effective. If you don't have room for a tree, you can do this with vines and other just shrubs and plants. Uh, shade the paved areas. So that urban heat island, if you've got a driveway, create shade on the driveway. That's an important place to keep it cool, shade the roof, shade your air conditioner. It'll help it uh, function more eff effectively. Just make sure you give ample room around the air conditioner for it to function, um, for air to flow freely. But if you can keep that cool, you'll also be saving energy. Um, and plant around the foundation. And then if you have a big enough property, you'll see this up in Wisconsin um, or other rural properties where you can plant a windbreak that provides uh, directs winds away from your home. You usually don't put those close up to the house, but you'll see that certainly in rural landscapes as well. Um, and then so the, just uh, to kind of hammer home that point, when we think about uh, carbon sequestration, that is something that we enjoy from urban trees. But because urban trees are not growing in a forest, they're not thriving, there's not really as many of them, that we're going to rely on Fred's forest trees to do much of the carbon sequestration. And Fred, I paid attention to the bars uh, that you had on that chart there. So carbon uptake, let's count on uh, forest trees. Energy savings, which reduces the demands that we have for energy, let's count on urban trees. Um, and so one, this is just a pet project of mine. Um, because my background in forestry, um, I started a project here uh, in Chicago and abandoned it a few years ago, but 
when we were losing trees to emerald ash borer, uh, we had an opportunity to reclaim wood products from trees. And we don't often think about that. The, the wood products that we have um, from our urban trees are not, they're not commercially available but they're an, an opportunity that is lost. Most of the urban landscape trees are removed deliberately. Um, they're not harvested for wood products. and We don't have systems in place uh, to harvest them, yet we still have an opportunity to keep that carbon stored uh, in the trees um, and use them in our home. So particularly if you have a relationship with a tree in your community or even in your own home, uh, there is this this growing potential for urban lumber. Um, and just because we don't think about trees in the same way that uh, Mary was talking about importing flour um, that, is, uh, that is exotic to a community, most of the wood that we consume comes from commercial forests, which are not in Illinois. We don't have a very high um, production of urban, uh, of, of forest products here. So most of the time we're bringing them in from the south or the northwest or the north. Um, but just think about it, if you have to take a tree down or a neighbor has to take a tree down or even in your community, and some of the com uh, suburban communities have done this where they've created urban wood demonstration products. Uh, we had a, this is the project that I started a few years ago um, with Emerald Ash Borer when I was at the Morton Arboretum. And we had a furniture show uh, where we demonstrated it was rising from ashes and those were uh, products made from ash trees. So if you ever have that opportunity, Think about saving your tree. There are local sawmills. You can go to that website um, and have a tree or again, a beloved neighbor's tree turned into something lovely. Our um, office desk is made from a tree from Lake Forest and our, and our mantle is made from uh, cherry trees. I'm not sure the, uh, where the cherry trees are from, but locally milled. So that's another, you know, buy local, harvest local. Um, so, and this is to bring it home a little bit um, about what Fred said is you want to preserve forest land. In the same vein, you want your trees um, to be thriving in the urban forest. So tree planting is vitally important, um, but the, the most valuable tree in the urban forest, and there's somebody's favorite tree, the ginkgo, um, that uh, if you can keep a tree alive, um, and that, Mary, this is to your husband's point about buying the, the um, elm tree with the house. Did, is that tree still alive? Are you treating that? Is that thumbs up if the tree's still alive you're, or still in you're on mute. Yes, okay, great. <laughs> so it's vitally important to keep, um, to keep trees alive because the ecosystem services, the shade, the cooling, the stormwater retention, the fresh air that it generates is all exponentially greater on a large tree. So the most important thing that you can do in terms of advocacy is making sure that the trees that are healthy, um, that are standing, are thriving. And just a note about uh, natives and exotics too. So native trees, we have a lot of advocacy for native trees um, and I am all for that as long as we have the ability to keep them alive and to keep them thriving and providing this kinds of ecosystem services that we need in the urban forest. And that is threatened just because of globalization. We no longer have um, native trees to the Chicago area have exotic diseases and threats to them. So just think about mixing that up a little bit. Emerald ash borer is an exotic pest on a native ash tree. And likewise, um, Dutch elm disease is brought in on a Native American elm. So please be open to exotic trees, the ones that will thrive um, and provide the services that we need, ecosystem services and shade benefits over their lifetime. Um, so keeping those trees alive, this is just a nod to arbor culture and uh, the, the thinking about planting trees in the right place, right tree in the right uh, place so that it has uh, the opportunity to live for a long time. And then pruning them and uh, choosing carefully where you place them, not under a power line, for example, uh, so that that tree canopy stays strong and sturdy and can endure the storms that are, um, that are with us now with climate change. Uh, and that you can uh, enjoy their benefits for a long period of time. This is where you might want to get professional help. This is why many of the suburban communities that you're from, as well as Chicago, invest in the tree care uh, to keep those trees uh, standing and, and healthy and vibrant over, um, over decades. Um, and then finally, to conclude, what can you do? Knowing this is an uh, advocacy group, and if I didn't identify already, I am 
uh, climate reality leadership trained and Cynthia and Jennifer are my uh, mentors there. So I'm totally on board with this and the, uh, the advocacy. So there's two immediate places um, that you can think about for beyond tree planting. And again, I heartily endorse that. Um, but there is a program um, actually at Open Lands Project, one of the, before it was tree keepers, I started the program there called Neighborwoods, which was about tree planting. And then when Mayor Daly got into office and I went to work for him, Open Lands Project shifted to tree care. And so the tree keepers program was, was born. And I was a tree, I taught tree identification for 10 years there. I'm retired, but um, the tree keepers course is a, is a, I think it's an, not inexpensive. It might be a free course at Open Lands Project where you take um, six or eight sessions, and then you volunteer to give some time back to uh, cultivating trees in the city. So that's a terrific option. If you're um, a city person, there are a lot of suburban people who take that. Most of the volunteer opportunities are in the city. If you're in the suburbs, there, I want you to consider tree commissions. And um, maybe if we have time for dialogue, many of your communities already have a tree commission or a sustainability or an environmental commission. And in my years of working with local governments, the commissions are um, highly valued and can be very effective. Uh, so consider joining an environmental commission, a tree commission, or asking your municipality to start one because this is a picture of a Downers Grove tree commission. Many of the commissions are doing um, public education that Mary was talking about, building value for trees, um, helping people understand them, cultivating uh, interest in, uh, with kids, working with tree preservation policy, uh, keeping an eye on the health and welfare of the, the city forestry program and advocating for tree planting. There's one other area of advocacy, and I, I'm way over time, but um, let's consider advocating for tree planting programs from the utilities, if you wanted to think about where your uh, tree planting program goes so that they can strategically plant and we can have this be effective at scale. So I am concluding my comments. I know, again, uh, uh, over time, and thank you for listening to me. Yeah, thank you very much, Edith. Um, so we are open for questions and dialogue, everybody. This, this is a lot to take in, but I'm glad we recorded it because I'd like to listen again. Uh, but let's just open, you know, turn off your mute button and uh, please feel free to jump in and, and uh, make comments or ask questions of anybody. I have a question for Edith. Um, has any, have efforts been made to educate developers at all about, you know, preserving trees, uh, urban lumber opportunities? I just had, a, I have a house going up next door and there was a huge, beautiful tree in, in a back corner that, first of all, wasn't bothering anything. You could have planted all, or you could have built all around it, but, you know, they took it down and I'm just wondering if they, if they're an opportunity to to yeah. educate. And this probably wood chips by now. So that's, um, so, the, and the tree preservation just in general, um, there was a, when the economy's strong, the, the trees go down really fast because of um, just building. So I worked for many, many years to try to help municipalities with tree preservation policies. And um, there are many communities that have successful ones. The North Shore tends to be particularly strong in tree preservation policies. So that opportunity uh, to restrict the removal of trees really lies with the city when there's building permits and there's lots of triggers for that. So there's a particularly strong uh, push for that with the North Shore communities and that's been successful. Uh, that's up to the city. The developers are rarely motivated to preserve the trees, although occasionally you see it. Um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of success in terms of educating the developers. If there's to be successful tree preservation, it's usually from the property owner that's hiring construction. Um, and there's a lot that's online about preserving trees because again, that's really where you're getting um, the ecosystem services and you cannot replace a tree once you, uh, a mature tree like that, once you take a mature tree down and you change the soil for construction, you're not going to get that same kind of, you know, say you take down a, a native oak tree that's been there for decades. Um, and the, you know, what you might be able to grow is going to be an urban tree that's just got a it's just, it's not, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to replant oak trees. So yeah, you really want to preserve that. And the, the um, urban wood movement, again, that would be something from the client um, that you could think about. There was a very, actually, someone who was from Wilmette, Wilmette, was it Mary from Wilmette or you were Renetka? Renetka. Renetka. Um, the village president in uh, Wilmette had a very successful, it was a really neat initiative. He was also um, involved in sports. Uh, he worked for a sports uh, uh, magazine. He was an attorney. 
Um, and when he took down ash trees in his backyard, he made baseball bats out of them. And they were widely distributed and they just got a lot of positive attention. Um, so th those are the kind of high profile things you can think about. But yeah, it really needs to be a champion, somebody that says, you know, I'll make sense. And a lot of the municipalities have, I've been very proud uh, to see them reclaim trees for, for products. Thanks. Edith, I had a question for you as, as well. Um, on your presentation on, on one of the slides, uh, it said that uh, turning trees, urban trees into mulch had zero carbon benefit and there was a slight carbon benefit for burning the urban trees for firewood. And uh, I, I was kind of surprised at that. I would think of the altar. I would think if you burn it, you're basically taking that carbon, making it CO2, putting it back in the atmosphere. And the mulch, some of the mulch would t return to the soil and the carbon would go into the, to, to the ground. I wonder if you or Fred could maybe comment yeah. on that. Fred, I, I didn't know I had something in there on firewood, but Fred, do you want to answer that? You probably have a uh, better knowledge of carbon cycle, although I'm Yeah, and I, it, honestly, I think the best answer is right, it's complex. There's been a lot of research done on what the net effect of wood is a, is a fuel source is in, in offsetting fossil fuels. Um, you are still getting emissions that might be comparable to fossil fuels if you're burning wood. And I, I think the, the modeling has to look out a number of years um, okay. to the regrowth that would occur <laughs> if we were all actually burning wood that was being replaced by new trees. That's where the net renewable effect. source. Right. Thank you. I, I can't say anything intelligent about the mulch, but that right. is the state of a lot of urban biomasses to go into mulch. Right. And that's just because it breaks down so quickly. Um, there's actually value in having the mulch protect the next generation of trees. Um, so that's an important, I'm not saying don't use mulch. Um, and it's great to use that product locally um, and nurture the next, you know, keep the soil healthy because soil actually uh, stores carbon um, as well, but it's it doesn't have that carbon storage that that uh, wood products might Understand. Thank you I have a question. Can I jump in? Sure. Okay, so I uh, have two questions actually one is for Fred um, and one is for Edith. So uh, For Fred, what is the impact of forest fires on the US forest sink because we're having quite a number of fires so yeah. that's one question. And then the second question is regarding the advocating for tree replanting by utilities. I am a former trustee of the village of Northfield. I borrowed my experience as utilities are fairly uncooperative. So that seems a really, really heavy lift. I'm just curious if you can comment on that. Yeah, great, great question. So the issue of fires, especially Western fires, um, is a, a real confounding factor in, in thinking about carbon budgets in forests. and. Those, those major fires, like the fires you we're reading about right now in Arizona, are, are really reversals. So the massive uh, pulses of CO2 are being released in those fires. And that needs to be accounted for in um, carbon modeling. And what makes that really challenging is that those events are so stochastic. So you, you um, the thinning and the sort of cultural work that'll help reduce fire intensity um, can be a plus, but at some point you could lose all that benefit in a, in a big fire. So it's, it's unfortunate that our western forests are really at risk because their climate change is driving them toward drier and hotter and more extreme conditions that are more difficult to recover from. Thanks. So I'll answer um, that question um, about the utility trees. Fred, you're done, right? Yes. Yeah, yep. okay. Um, that's a, and that's a great question. I was, I was hoping that you would take the, the bait on that one. Um, because the Forest Service, it, it was about 30 years ago or 20 years ago that, um, on, when Mayor Daley uh, was leading the, the tree program, that we invited the U.S. Forest Service in to look at the ecosystem benefits of trees. And that's when we really got excited about the utility um, uh, tree planting opportunities for shading. Um, that has been, the Forest Service has put a lot of resources into studying that. Um, and what they, because they've been able to effectively model it, and I was going to have a link for you, I'll probably follow up with it, um, but they, they've actually developed a program um, that evolved from something called iTree and the uh, Davy Tree, where you can 
model the shade benefits um, and the energy benefits of where you place your tree on your property. And I promise I'll send that follow-up link. Because it's documentable and demonstrated, and it varies where you put it, where your climate is, what kind of uh, a mix of power you have in your utility, <clears throat> what the energy savings potentials are. But some utilities have said, okay, we can demonstrate that there is enough energy savings potential that we can, we can invest in that. And so the utility programs, um, the energy saving programs that you get from utilities are all based on the amount of savings, uh, kilowatt savings that they are, therm savings that they are able to demonstrate uh, to the state regulators. So it's called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Certain states have been able to get tree planting programs accepted as an, a documented utility-based energy conservation program. And we've seen successful ones in um, California where they can say, we put in a tree, it's gonna cost us $80, we're gonna monitor this one and our models say that in 30 years we're gonna save energy. They do have, they're not the Northern climate, so that's the most successful one. In Iowa, they have a utility-sponsored tree planting program, which recognizes that there's a lot of co-benefits, which again, Fred, to your slides, of having those trees. And even if they, they could, but they feel deem it not cost-effective enough to invest in tree planting exclusively for the energy savings potential, but for the, uh, the co-benefits. So a group called Trees Forever um, has a very successful utility partnership where they're doing tree planting with um, with community organizations throughout Iowa. In um, Illinois, Commonwealth Edison, I think, uh, bought into a program, that, the best uh, uh, mind behind the, the uh, tree planting bene uh, energy conserving benefits from trees is the National Arbor Day Foundation. And they have partnered to offer programs to utilities where they will provide the trees if the utility wants to offer those programs. And so the advocacy opportunity is to help ComEd step that up. Um, in, I'm gonna get really geeky on energy and you can tell me to quit, um, but every four years, and because I come from trees, uh, this was just an opportunity that I actually got to work with utilities and enjoyed the challenge. But every four years, the utilities revisit the uh, renewable portfolio standard and what their offerings will be. This is why they roll out the, you know, the, the refrigerator buyback program or start offering the Nest thermostat because there's an, a robust evaluation process that says um, these are new technologies where we could save energy. And we pitched um, four years ago with Elevate Energy, I pitched to them a tree planting program and they nibbled, but it didn't go anywhere. And they're in the next four year cycle. So if you wanted to explore that, I think that might be a really pivotal way. Well, again, volunteer tree planting is terrific the utilities have so much more impact um, than, than any one tree planting. So that's why I think that's a really neat advocacy opportunity. What about land the utilities own? You know, utilities own so much you exactly. know, right away and all that stuff. They have made some progress. And Fred, you might know of some things um, that are going on in Wisconsin too, but nationally uh, they have, uh, come to generally in the utility in industry, there has been some progress made about managing their right of ways responsibly. So you'll see some pollinator habitats where they've realized maybe we don't have to do the mowing and cutting um, if we can convert these into sustainable uh, prairie restoration or pollinator right away. So Fred, do you have any insight on that? Um, no, I, th I think that's right though, the transmission right of ways, mm -hmm. especially right. The ones in you know, outlying areas, there is a, a trend and a lot of public interest in seeing prairie or native species or compatible habitat as opposed to just the mowing and herbicide treatment. So that yeah. it, utilities are at a point where they really need to show that they're moving with climate and you know stepping up to the plate with goals toward becoming carbon neutral. And we're seeing that examples of that commitment in different ways. But I think the right of way management is, is an important one. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I, I'm also looking at the time. Michelle, I need to look to you to tell me if we still have time for more questions or we don't. Um, we could take one more briefly, if anybody has one last question. I have a question. Kristen, oh, I'm glad you could join Hi. us. Hi. Yes. Oh, I've been here. Sorry. I've just been trying to hide my three-year-old from everyone. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if um, in the effort to kind of preserve trees, 
if there's ever been any effort to um, create some kind of marker on terms of like Zillow or properties where you're kind of already having a, a landowner look at it, want to buy it and say like, hey, this, this property probably won't flood because it has mature trees around it or kind of elevating that ecosystem and bringing that to life in terms of property value. Is there anything like that? I like it, but I'm yeah. not. <laughs> I really, I really like that. My husband's an arborist, and he was just heartbroken um, the other day. He came home, and somebody had a giant cottonwood tree. And cottonwoods are a native tree; they're incredibly, they're just so massive. Uh, they're really important in stormwater. Um, and the property owner was upset because the the cotton seeds were getting in the air conditioner, and he said this is why your, pro your, your property is not flooding and he didn't win and another company came in and took the tree down. So yeah, he no, came home very They could have yeah. just green over the AC. How stupid. I, right. Totally. <laughs> but I, I like it's that really, idea. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, idea. really interesting. Like you can imagine the tech entrepreneurs who would figure out how to use LiDAR or other mm -hmm. thing to score. Yeah. Yeah. Well, between the stormwater and um, the cooling and whatever you tell, I mean, you, there are, and people looking to like leave cities right now because of COVID, right. you know, I think there's yeah. a lot of property interests. So maybe on a platform that, um, you know, has benefits to offer where it just shows yeah. like data. Uh, I don't know where to start it, but. Wow. That's but great. call me. <laughs> <laughs> there's like a walk score for your, your, your neighborhood. You could get a tree yeah. score. That would be Right. Exactly. A tree score, a native tree score, some kind of green score we could talk about how many native like, mm -hmm. uh, like mowing for example if you've really big yards and you don't want to think about how much it's going to cost to maintain you know mm -hmm. what portion of that property is um i forget what you called it um but like natural mm -hmm. uh, native species that you know can self-sustain yeah. that area you know uh, if, real quick uh, edith if you have anything on the impact uh of, on stormwater of trees, like any data, if could sure. you send that along when you send the other mm -hmm. stuff you're going to send? That'd be great to have. I'd, I'd love to see that too. Well, um, we just had one question in the chat box from Sarah that I don't want to forget, and then we'll and then we'll have to finish up with other business. But she asked uh, who might be working on advocating with Commonwealth Edison the role that they could be playing and. Um, would it be the Citizens Utility Board who would do some advocating, or is there any role they could play? And I'll say, um, yes, it was Elevate Energy and I that made the pitch to ComEd, and I will say NICOR was very receptive. Commonwealth Edison said kind of interesting, um, but, but because Elevate Energy is, knows energy really well, they were able to model um, the predicted savings. And that, uh, Kristen, to kind of your point about the ecosystem services, I will send that link um, to follow up with what that, that modeling program is. It's just been a while since I've looked at it where you can model the ecosystem services from your trees. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Michelle, do you wanna? Yeah, actually, Jennifer, you have the, some slides. Why don't you take it from here and, and wrap it up? Yeah, well, we're just reminding um, people of some things coming up. Um, most of you hopefully have heard that Climate Reality is having a, an online global training since we could not have any of our five US trainings that were planned for this year. Um, but they'll be accepting a lot, of, a lot of applicants and I think that's open until June 25th. So you still have time to apply climaterealityproject.org slash training. Um, I had a slide for that. Um, but, and then just other events coming up. I will share my screen. Maybe this one, just to get a visual. Um, this Saturday is um, the Poor People's Campaign. Um, oh, I was going to go. Is having a big online. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah, yeah, we got it. Okay. Um, we're mobilizing partners, Climate Reality, with the Poor People's Campaign. Um, Reverend William Barber II um, picked up this campaign that was originally started by um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so there's a huge event that was meant to be in Washington, D.C., and it's mobile. So maybe um, check it out, uh, june2020.org. That's this Saturday. 
And then reminding everyone that we've got our next book club. We mentioned it earlier at the beginning, if people might not have been on the call yet, but we're, re we're reading This Changes Everything. And I know Jane wants me to point out that don't worry if you haven't read the whole book. Um, there's a lot of climate history and it's really overarching for the climate crisis. So we highly encourage you to join that on Sunday, June 28th. Um, I guess this says AM, but we will not be going all day. That will be 7.30 PM to 5.45 PM. And then our next monthly chapter meeting is um, July 16th, Thursday. Um, so mark your calendars and you can always check out our calendar at climaterealitychicago.com slash calendar. Great, thank you. Okay. Well, I, I, I think we can do, one thing you can do digitally is you can all clap. And I would just like to have a round of applause for Fred and, and Mary and yeah. Peter. <laughs> um, that, that I, I found it really helpful. Uh, I appreciate it very much. And uh, we're at our next meeting, we can talk about what the follow-up will be for our chapter. Like, so think about ideas you have for what we could be doing um, to foster protection of our current trees, reforesting where we don't have them, and reducing the heat island effect in Chicago, uh, et cetera. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for having me. Good. I'm gonna feed Come on, T. Jennifer, I did put some chat uh, links in the chat. Okay, yeah. I, so I don't know if you can say those or if you have a way I can I can follow up later. I just wanted to get them out fast. Nice. Thank you so much. Sure. Or I can follow up with an email. All right, thank you. Thanks. Good night. Bye bye.